Amen. Amen. We thank God. We thank God for this Amen. day. This is the day that the Lord has made. And we thank him. We, we praise him. We exalt his name. He's good. And his mercy endures forever. I'm very grateful to the Lord for the fact that he has brought us and uh, his grace. The Bible says his grace is sufficient. And so we, we thank him and uh, we bless his name. If it were not for him, surely I don't know where I would be. But I want to really thank the Lord uh, for the grace that he has given me, that divine enable, enablement. I am reminded of this verse that says um, uh, that I should abide in him. Uh, just like the branch cannot uh, exist on its own, can't stand on its own, it should abide in the vine. And he says, from apart from me, because for apart from me, you can do nothing. And so I'm persuaded that um, even today, apart from the Lord, I can do nothing. He is the author of salvation. He's everything in my life. And so I really want to thank the Lord for that. And I believe that you too, you are thanking the Lord. And so today we want to uh, change a little bit been looking about a lot about ministry and how to conduct ministry but i think it's important that we also look at what is our message and the only way to do it is to get into the message itself uh, so that we can understand the message of salvation i thought this is an important subject because um, already the message of salvation is highly distorted what is preached in uh, some, some of the places and some of the very good preachers is a little bit out of the original message of salvation. And the moment you just get out of the message itself, then you expect that the results will be different. The message, uh, the true message of salvation brings true conversion. And so we will be able to look at uh, this subject. I think we'll uh, have a series on this so that we are able to look at the message itself and understand it well. I felt that, uh, I don't want to assume that when we go out there, we really know what we are going to preach. Uh, you may use different approaches. You may use different examples, different parables. You may use different verses. You may quote uh, your preaching text from the Old Testament or from the New Testament. It doesn't matter, but the message is one. The message is one and it must be very clear and it should not be confused because if you miss it, then um, you are likely uh, to miss also on the intended results. So we'll look at that in our series of mentoring missioners. And I thought uh, maybe we should begin by talking about uh, defining salvation itself. We can look a little bit from uh, uh, the Hebrew uh, dictionaries. And I have a couple of meetings that I was able to see the word salvation I found it first mentioned in Genesis 49, verse 18, um, where the Bible says, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. Uh, and when you look at uh, the meaning of salvation as it is um, indicated there, the meaning is, is Yeshua. Um, and that uh, has a meaning of to save something, to deliver something, set, to set free something. Eh? It has um, the meaning of help into victory. It has the meaning of um, endo, endowment uh, with prosperity. It also has the meaning of blessing of good health or welfare. That is in the Old Testament context. And I think it's good to understand this. This is the Old Testament. I found another uh, close word, still a Hebrew word. And this word is yesha. Yesha, and Yesha, uh, if, you, if you pick it up from uh, Psalms 18 verse 2, which is also in the Old Testament, uh, it says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. There are a lot of uh, adjectives that are used there to describe who God is to, to, the, to, to, to King David when he was writing this psalm. And the Bible says, 
this is a psalm that he wrote when he was being uh, being uh, chased by Saul and he wanted to kill him. So he wrote this psalm, he sang this psalm, and he began to talk about God as his rock, his fortress, his deliverer. He called him his strength. He said, he's my trust. He's my buckler or small shield. And uh, he's the horn of my salvation. And he said, he's my high tower. He already gives you the picture of, of a battlefield, the picture of a battle. Because when you're talking about towers in the Old Testament, really we're talking about places that uh, gives you an advantage and an undue advantage over your enemies. Uh, it, it, when you're talking about deliverer, you're talking about your fortress, that, 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 that these are actually uh, things to do, uh, military hiding places. Uh, he talks about is my rock, um, showing that stability and strength and uh, immovable. Uh, so, so David is describing him and he says he's my, the horn of my salvation. This meaning, this salvation, this word salvation at this point, uh, yesha, uh, refers to liberty, deliverance, prosperity, safety, salvation, or, or simply saving. And you can, you, can, you can be able to relate with David in what he was going through. Another uh, quick meaning from uh, the Old Testament, I think this will be last, the last one, is uh, Teshua. Oh yeah, to sure, which is closer again to the ones that we have looked at before. And in Psalms 37 verse 39, it says, um, but the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. Uh, he's saying the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord, or it comes from the Lord, or is, it comes through the Lord. The salvation of the righteous is authored by the Lord. This is what he's trying to say. And he's saying the righteous actually depend on him as strength in time of trouble. So again, salvation is associated with trouble. Uh, we can't talk about salvation or saving without trouble or, or some kind of um, a threat that, that uh, one is facing. So we'll be able to look at that meaning as we move on. Uh, and as if you look at the details of what um, that um, Hebrew word uh, means, it it is really referring to rescue, uh, whether whether national rescue or, or spiritual rescue or personal rescue. Basically, it's, it's talking about rescue. You're talking about deliverance. It's talking about help, safety, salvation, victory. Now again, when you hear the word victory. Uh, it means there must be some fight, and that them, and that uh, with God there is a winner, and the winner is the one that God is rescuing uh, and giving victory in that battle. So, so salvation must be understood in this context. Uh, when we go to the New Testament, we get even a much deeper meaning, which will help us to to know. And I think we will build our understanding much more on uh, what we get from the, from, the, from the New Testament. And it does not in any, mean, in any way negate the meanings we have in the Old Testament. Both of them are really uh, important and they apply, uh, but it would be uh, wrong to emphasize the Old Testament meaning and do away with the New Testament meaning. So this is why I'm comparing both of them. So you find in the Old Testament, there are two words that I was able to find quite common. And the New Testament, we are talking about the Greek, Greek translation. So this is uh, uh, from, from, from Greek. We will not talk about Hebrew here. Soteria, uh, uh, soteria is, a, is a Greek word which is really referring to um, uh, salvation. And uh, you will find this word used in Luke chapter 6, verse 69, and in Luke 19, verse 9. Luke 6, 69. He's talking about, and he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. So again, Jesus Christ is being referred to as the horn of salvation. You can see the very meaning we saw in Psalms 18, horn of salvation. Uh, you can see it's being used in the New Testament. But now the Greek word here will be able to explain its meaning as we move on. It is also the same word that is used in Luke 19, uh, verse 9, where Jesus was talking about Zacchaeus. And he said to him that this day salvation has come to this house. 
for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. Now, the meaning here is uh, basically it's talking about rescue or safety, whether physically or morally. It's rescues. It, it, is, it brings the meaning of deliverance. Uh, it brings the meaning of health. Uh, saving power or salvation itself to save or just simply saving. Uh, there is another word uh, that I found, again, in the, in the, in the New Testament. And uh, this is found uh, in, in Luke chapter 2, verse 30, where Simeon, who held the, uh, Jesus by his hands, and, and he began to prophesy the little, uh, about the little baby Jesus. This man, uh, the Bible says, uh, the Holy Spirit had revealed unto him that he, will, he should not die until he is able to see the consolation of Israel. And this is what he said when he was holding the hands of this baby. He said, for mine eyes, in Luke chapter 2, verse 30, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. So this salvation, again, the word salvation here is, has the meaning of defender. It's like he was saying, for my eyes have seen the defender, the defender of Israel, the defender of mankind. So uh, it brings in the, the, the meaning of uh, defense of simp or simply salvation itself. So uh, I want to put a summary putting together both what we find in the Old Testament and in the New, and then we'll be able to um, zero in for the New Testament and speak a little bit more uh, of what we will find in the New Testament. So as a matter of intro, let's get into the message now. In summary, we would say this, that salvation has to do with rescue from threat. Mm -hmm. It has to do with setting free from captivity or danger. So there's an enemy that is threatening to hold you in captivity and your life is in danger, so you need salvation. It also uh, brings in the meaning of getting wholesome help for health and prosperity. So it is a, it's really a whole package. Uh, if we look at this meaning, it really means that there, there is some sort of threatened threat or deadly con condition that um, we must be rescued from. And we must understand that otherwise salvation has no meaning if you don't understand the threatening condition. Man is helpless without God. Um, the scripture teaches that, I've just, I just shared, that apart from me, you can do nothing. The enemy who sits on himself uses deception to make man believe that he can make it on his own without God. This is, this is, a, this is a common belief um, that I don't have to have God. And they look at God as religion. But God is not religion. Religion is imitation of God's um, will. It's, it's an imitation of what God, God's purposes are. And we don't preach religion. And this is, this is very strong. We should understand it. And we should actually not uh, preach religion. We should not even preach our denomination. Much as you, probably you and I belong to a very nice church with a wonderful and fancy name. But we should not preach about it. It doesn't save. It has no power to save. We should preach about the real salvation. Otherwise, we will fall into this deception that we are talking about. So that certain scheme is to be able to deceive mankind. And that's why whenever you're talking to people, maybe witnessing, maybe telling them about Jesus Christ, telling them they can be born again, the, the argument will be revolving around, but I'm okay. I mean, I'm all right. I, I'm, I, I, I don't trouble people. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm, I'm on my own. I, I've, I don't have a problem. I don't have a problem with you. Why, why do you want me to change? You know? And so um, unless the Holy Spirit helps us and we are wise in how to communicate the gospel to break this deception that Satan covers people with, I can assure you salvation will still not be understood. And, um, but when God gives us the power by his spirit through prayer, you know, and um, through understanding the message that we have, we are carrying, and then by his wisdom and by his grace, we are able to penetrate, then it's, it will be able to see a, convert, on, a conversion resulting out of the message. Those who carry the message of salvation have to fight the resistance of Satan through prayer and persistence 
in preaching the gospel. I think I should really, really emphasize this. This should be emphasized by all meaning. I think I should bold it that those who carry the message of salvation, they should uh, be able to fight the resistance of Satan through prayer, through persistence in preaching the gospel. So we, we've got to um, build up a force, a force that cannot be reckoned with, a force that, um, that knows no stopping. You know, and this is why the language you find in the Bible about Jesus and the gospel says that I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We have to embrace that. We have to embrace that combative spirit and, that, and, and know how to engage in prayer and persistent preaching of a gospel. And that's why whenever you pay the price of preaching the gospel, uh, they, they will always be good results. There will be there will be wonderful, wonderful results. But if you just um, you know pull out whenever you find something small, you know just throws you away, my friend, you can't preach this gospel because the enemy has a mission to stop us. And this is why we are talking about the message. The enemy deceives believers through persecution, hardships, and other problems of this life so that they lose focus on the gospel and concentrate on how to survive or how to prosper in their earthly life. And this is what is really, really prevalent out there in many, many places. Oftentimes you tune on a, a wonderful a program of a TV program, but if you follow, you find uh, this, it, it looks like it's about gospel. It looks like it's about the message of salvation, but you find it tilted to the minor meaning of salvation about how we will get help and we'll be rescued here on earth from the trouble we face. That is true, he will rescue us, but that's not the heavy meaning. That is belittling the, wall, the, the work that Jesus Christ actually did on the cross. You know, it's, it's belittling uh, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, battles that we really have to fight to have to communicate our message across. And it's uh, uh, actually looking and uh, you know, we're just just failing to recognize that uh, we we are talking about two kingdoms here. I think we'll have much more to talk about that in the times ahead, God willing. But the scriptures are very clear here. The scripture tells us in First Timothy chapter six verse eight that we need to develop the attitude and the mind of operating with the minimum. That way, the enemy will not be able to use persecutions, hardships, problems you know, lack and, and limitations of this life uh, to distort us. We'll be strong enough. You may not be looking very good on earth here, uh, but uh, we should be thinking in terms of that. And since uh, if we, we, we have food and we have clothing, we should be contented with that. And that should be good enough for us to uh, be able uh, to preach the gospel. Amen. So that background is important for us to understand. And this is why we are saying, can we revisit the message that we are to preach? Can we revisit um, what are we to preach? And if we do that, we'll also be doing double work, double blessing, because we will not only preach the right message, but the people that will get born again and the people that we will raise through our, our ministry will be people that are embracing the same gospel message. That is why Paul was very bold and he was telling them, he would write to the churches and tell them about the message he preached to them, that there should be, they should not be deviated from it because the threat to deviation is very high. And if it was high then, much more will it be in these last days when the Bible warns us that many will actually leave the faith, they will depart from the faith and will give a heed to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. These are very dangerous days. And so understanding the message of salvation is okay. And I uh, think that it's a good message. We could look at the first part of it. I think we will um, look at a little bit of it today, and then we'll continue uh, in the next one. I feel I, we need to say here that uh, uh, man, man needs a savior or a rescuer. And that the only rescuer is God, and that there is no other. 
this is the author or the captain of our salvation. We need to understand that Jesus Christ does not share this, this power. He says, I have power to lay down my life and I have, I have power to take it up again. He is the only one, he is the only one yesterday, today, and forever that has that power. And that means all other religions, all other uh, thinking really is not going to bear meaning. And all other things, all other persons that are appointed to this, you know, all other persons that um, are drawn to this kind of thing, uh, they end up forming religion, something that imitates the purposes of Christ. So he, 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 is, he is the mighty man of war. He is he's the one who leads the rescue battle. And we need to know that, and we need to uphold him. And he needs to be in our mouth to speak. We need to declare him. We need to praise him. We need to honor him. We need to lift up his name. And by so doing, his grace to save will increase in our midst. His power to save will increase in our midst. This is very important. He should be in our songs when we are singing. As our songs should not be about ourselves and about our prosperity and about how you know uh, uh, you will be blessed and how then how God will fight your enemies. You know those who don't like you, those who said you will not make it. Our songs should not concentrate on that. That is a very small meaning of our salvation. Our songs should be talking about the mighty man of war, Jesus Christ himself, who has uh, actually become the author of our salvation. And in Revelation chapter 7 verse 10 says this, the Bible says, John saw a host of angels that cried out in a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. That should be in our song. That should be in our praise. That should be what comes out of our mouth when we are praising him, when we gather together to worship. Salvation belongs to our God. In other words, salvation actually is authored by God himself, no other. And Acts chapter 4 verse 12 emphasizes it again. It says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now we are getting into the scriptures. Now we are getting into the word of God. Now we are getting into the message of our salvation. The Bible says we have a name. Our message is about a name. And this name we've been given from heaven and that there is no other name. This may sound contradictory. This may, may sound, uh, 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 um, you know, like you're selfish, that you're saying, you know, God does not love other people. No, 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 no. God loved the whole world. He gave a son. And that son has paid a price, and his name is able to serve us. The Bible says there's no other name. There is only one name, and that name is Jesus Christ. Of course, we will be able to see that as we move on. Now, this is important. There is no salvation in another. It is only found in Jesus. That should be your message. Don't go to talk about the goodness of God when you are witnessing to somebody to get saved. Tell them there is a rescuer to rescue you from your danger. And then define that danger, that situation that is causing this fellow uh, to, to see and to need salvation. And oftentimes, by God's grace and by his, by his mercy, we'll be, he'll be able to understand uh, that. Now, let me, let me flow into three important meanings. I think um, I need to, to look at three important meanings of salvation. Uh, I'll probably tonight we'll look at one, uh, but this one will magnify it because it brings out the message of our salvation. And one of the meanings I want to talk about of salvation is redemption redemption or to buy back yeah just just means to purchase back it belonged to you it left you but you have to pay a price to get it back redemption now jesus is called our redeemer 
He is our redeemer because he's the one who has paid the price of our being brought back, back to the Father, back to the fellowship of our God. The benefit and the death that comes through Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection from the dead is what we call redemption. Redemption. And, and it has to do with the blood. The blood shed by Jesus Christ. Jesus, the man Jesus, the mediator between God and man. That is the salvation. That is our source of salvation. Now, the word redemption is very important. And that's why in our singing, in our testimonies, in our preaching, we should talk about the Redeemer. That's our message. Amen. In the Old Testament, the primary Hebrew word that, uh, that is translated save or salvation, as we have been able to see, really largely concentrates on God saving power in real life situations. Situations that these people are facing, battles, you know, they're going to fight, fight with the Philistines, you know, and they are to trust God. God is our salvation. They are, they are fighting the Syrians. God is our salvation. And th that's how they viewed and that's how they saw him because they understood that uh, battles that are physical are first fought in the spiritual. They understood that. Now in the New Testament, the dominant meaning that really comes through is the meaning of deliverance from a number of things. And we want to look at one, deliverance from the consequences of sin. That is a meaning of salvation. Deliverance from the consequences of sin. Deliverance from the consequences of sin. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, Amen. No, no. The, 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 the consequences that we are talking about here is the eternal punishment, which is called the wrath of God. The eternal punishment called the wrath of God. Very important. We need to get that very, very clearly. That there is a punishment. And all human beings are actually faced with that. First Thessalonians 1.10, Romans 5.9, we are all under wrath. Unless something really happens to change man's condition, he or she is on his way to eternal hell. Why? Because God punishes sin according to his law, and God cannot change. God punishes sin. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. Man has to die, he has sinned. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So man has to die. And the death we're talking about is much more than just leaving this physical body. We are talking about eternal death or eternal separation from God. This is what we are talking about here. Amen. And so um, uh, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, the Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. That's God's law. Now, the good news, and this is what we call the gospel, the good news is that God, in his mercy, in his goodness, in the richness of his mercy and abundance of his faithfulness and his goodness, he has made provision that another person can stand and die in the place of man. And it's only one person. And his name is Jesus. Just to remind you, his name is Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, Romans Amen. chapter 23 to verse 26 would be important for us to read together. And it's going to bless us. Romans chapter 3, verse 26, 23 to 26, in NIV version, I'll read it for you. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Look at the word justify freely. It's a free gift. Somebody has worked on it and given you as a gift. And then verse 25 says, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. That's why it's a ransom a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. So when I have faith 
in his blood. The blood that he shed when he died, that death, that punishment, as Isaiah says, that the punishment that we, were de we deserve has fallen on him, faith in his blood. The Bible says he did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand and punished. And verse 26 says, but he did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so that to, so, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus Christ. So in other words, God still reserves punishment of sin. It is there. And that is why if you read uh, 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 the, the gospel, um, uh, John, John 3, uh, uh, 16, and you go downward, 17, 18, the Bible begins to talk about he didn't come to condemn the world, but he came so that the world can be saved through him. But whosoever has not believed in the Son is already condemned. So there is an already sentence of condemnation. There is already, already a sentence on every man because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. This is our message. And we must strive to convince man. This is our message. And this is the message of salvation. And the good news is, your death has been taken by someone else. You don't have to die and suffer eternal punishment. You don't have to be eternally separated from God. You don't have to. There, there is a rescuer. Someone has come to pay and to stand in for you. Somebody has come to pay your freedom. Why not accept it? It's a free gift. That's our message. Now, there is, there, there, there's something else we need to know about our salvation. We are saying that Jesus Christ, when he came, if you look at where we started, when we are defining redemption, the New Testament, you know, this New Testament meaning of deliverance, we are saying it has some three powerful meanings that we need to understand here. Deliverance from the consequences of sin. And the, seal, the, sin, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Unless there is a rescuer that comes in and intervenes, then we are headed to death. We are headed to eternal punishment. We are heading to hell. And we cannot escape that. Now we have seen that. So let's go now to what else have we been delivered from? Because this salvation is about deliverance. Deliverance from the fear of death. Death has been a threat to man's continuous life. It came as a consequence of sin. There was no death before sin came. But when sin came, death also came in. Amen. A lot of world religion today, they revolve around their belief about death and what happens after death. That is, that is what religion is, because they really cannot be able to, to know. And they fear, and they interpret, and they make meanings, and they make laws, and they make beliefs. All surrounding death. And Satan has played a very big game here for, for these world religions to be formed and to thrive. Even today, churches that originally understood and preached the true gospel, some of them have compromised by introducing their own laws, their own beliefs in areas surrounding death. So you find people have certain things that they say about the life after death. And it's not even the Bible. It's actually an off thing. Death has a sting, the Bible teaches. In fact, we can read this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, 56 and 57. The Bible says, the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there is victory over death. Literally, the, re the, the resurrection of Jesus from the, from the dead is power to overcoming death. Death cannot put man down. And that's why a Christian should not fear death. You should not fear eternal death and you should not fear even physical death because you are connected to the savior you are connected to the rescuer and you need to believe that and you need to be strong 
and you need to be a proper, a strong preacher, a strong herald of the same. Amen. You, you are free. You should not, uh, you should not, somebody should not threaten you that you should join a certain church so that you are buried well. You don't need that. By the way, you don't need it. You need to receive the true salvation. And this is our preaching that we need to pass to our people, preach to our communities, preach in every place to our friends, our colleagues. We need to tell them this is our message. Amen. We should not fear death. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, a powerful scripture. It says, for, for as much as then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, that's Jesus Christ himself, likewise took part of the same, that through death, that is, that means his death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So the fear of death has, has made mankind come into a lifetime bondage. And I can assure you, some of the people I meet, you know, they are so, they are so clinging to their religion and to the, what they believe in and, and what, what they know about death and about what will happen after death. And, you, and you, they don't want to change because they are bound. There is bondage. The Bible says that bondage, Jesus came to break it. That's our message. This is the message of our salvation. He came to deliver us from the bondage of the fear of death. We don't have to fear death. Hallelujah. We don't have to Amen. fear death. Amen. And, and Amen. the other thing that he came to rescue us from, which really I want to uh, emphasize, he came to res rescue us from the rule of Satan's kingdom. Right from the garden, what Satan was looking is to establish a kingdom and deceive man. We read in the scriptures and we understand that Satan was an angel, an archangel for that matter, and with angels that actually followed him in his rebellion. And now he came to deceive man in the garden so that he can be able to ruin mankind and man created with the image of God. Man, very special to God, very special to the heart of God, Satan, decided to come with a deceiving message so that he can be able to mislead man and have the rule over man by man compromising God's law. In fact, in Revelation, the Bible calls Satan the accuser of brethren. He will always be accusing us in the heavenly court, but at the same time, he's deceiving us here on earth. So if you, you get confused, you get, you get into the things that God doesn't want, and he accuses you, and he, he accuses you in your conscience, and, and, and this is the schemes of Satan. But the Bible teaches us that Jesus Christ was revealed so that we can be set free from the rule of Satan. In fact, that is the, the whole idea of the whole armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6 from verse 10 and down. That's the whole idea that we are equipped with spiritual weapons to be able to fight principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness, spiritual hosts in wicked places. This is why uh, we need to understand that you cannot talk about salvation without talking about a fight. It's about a fight. And we have to come out as the ones that are the redeemed of the Lord, the redeemed, the delivered of the Lord. The free, the one that were freed by the power of his blood. And this is why this is important that it dominates what we say because he is called the high priest of our profession, the high priest of what we confess, what we stand on, what we say is our belief, yeah? What we stand for, for, for as our faith, our belief. He is the one who reinforces it in the spirit world. It's a battle. And we must train the people we are preaching to, waki or koka, wana shika himoto, right from the word go. That way, we will be able to build an army of the people of God that know no defeat. Satan, the accuser of brethren, is defeated. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12 of, uh, to 14, if you can read it in the NIV version, this is what he says. It says, giving thanks, verse 12, 
to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. I just love this word, qualified you. Me and you, my brother, my sister, we do not have qualification to inherit the kingdom of God or any virtue of that kingdom. It's called the kingdom of light. We have no qualification. There is nothing, no effort, no man's effort can be able to make him inherit the kingdom of light or the kingdom of God. No man, not any effort can make me get into true salvation. I'll be convincing myself because probably I don't want to uh, be, be, you know, take up the message. And that's why the Bible says, whosoever believes, it's got to be whosoever believes. It's, it's anchored on what we will believe, whether we will believe the message or not. But our work is to preach. Those who believe, they are saved. That's our work. So we are qualified to enter into this kingdom. We are qualified to inherit what Jesus Christ brought us because he is the one who qualifies us. So he's not only our, our ransom, he has paid the ransom, but he is also our qualifier. He is the one who justifies us. He's the one who makes us right. I am not right, but because he has stood as the righteous one, he makes me right. So my past sins are forgiven and he begins to deal with the sins of the present so that I'm able to overcome. You will have time to really talk about that in the days ahead. But when, let us look at this, that verse 13 says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. That's the rule of darkness. And brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves or his beloved son. This is telling us this, that our message has to be a kingdom message. There are two kingdoms here. And we must know there is a kingdom of Satan which operates on deception, but there is a kingdom, the kingdom of the dear son of God, whom God loves, he calls him my beloved. And that kingdom is the kingdom of light and it operates on truth. The Bible says wisdom and truth came by Jesus Christ. So he's, he is the one. He is the one to rescue us. The Bible says we are rescued. Now he's talking to the church at Colossae and encouraging them. Paul is telling them he rescued you from the dominion of darkness. Darkness does not rule over you again. You belong to a kingdom of light. This is what he's telling them. This is our message. And this helps us to, to be able to help people not to fear Satan, not to fear, to, not to fear Satanism, not to fear cults, not to fear witchcraft, because we belong to a higher kingdom. We belong to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And that kingdom, Jesus Christ has come to establish it. And so we must preach it. We are part of establishing that kingdom. So we must preach that kingdom. And that kingdom is what is making us escape the dominion of darkness. He has literally made us escape and rescued us and planted us into the kingdom of the dear son of God. That deserves a big, a big amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, Amen. I want to sum it up using John 3.16 um, uh, maybe uh, all the way up to 18. Uh, John 3.14 maybe we could say uh, all the way up to 18. Let's, let's sum it up uh, here and it's going to be okay. So in summary, what is our message? from just what we have shared today. What is our message? Look at John 3, 14, uh, up, uh, 14 to 18. Verse 14 says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up. This is our message. Before I read the other verses, I need to amplify this. That's why I've put some phrase there in red as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So you need to understand what happened in the wilderness. What happened in the days of Moses? And you need to understand that there was a threat, that serpents had been released in the wilderness 
massive serpent and they were biting people and they were dying. They were biting people and they died. They were biting people and they died. But Moses was instructed by God to make a bronze serpent. And that bronze serpent was hung on a tree and hung very highly so that the whole congregation of Israel had the opportunity to look at that belief that by that instruction, provision of God that is raised up, they could be able to escape the, the bitings of the serpents and would live. The Bible says those who looked up to that serpent, they believed that God has provided salvation. The Bible says they did not die. But those who never did it, they were bitten by the serpents and they died. And you all know that the serpent, serpent is the other name for the devil himself. He is the ancient serpent. So what happened in the wilderness is actually a picture of a spiritual battle of the enemy releasing hosts of darkness to be able to cause man to die. But God has provided salvation. <coughs> so our message must be very clear. That Amen. Jesus Christ must be lifted up. He was lifted up at Calvary and was crucified and everybody saw. And that must be our witness. It must be our testimony. We must talk about it. And that is why you find some people saying, actually, he's not the one who died. God will not just allow his son to die a shameful death. He was replaced by somebody else. But Jesus was very careful. Before he died, he said, I'm going to shed my life. I'm going to lay my life. Nobody can take it away from me. I'm the one willingly laying it down. And I'm the one who willingly, who willingly picks it up. So uh, I'm going to do it. And he said, I'm going to, to, have, to have a very important supper with you. And, and he had the Passover with them. And he said, this is my blood. He talked about this blood. He talked about his body. And he said, as, much, as long as you keep taking this, it, this, is, this is what will maintain the, the meaning of, of, of being lifted to that tree so that salvation can get to man. That this continue doing, and as you continue doing it, you will be declaring about me, about my name, about my blood, about my salvation until I come. Why was he doing that? Because Jesus knew there will come other people by the deception of the enemy to deviate the message. And so we must stick to the original message and lift it up like Moses lifted the, the serpent in the wilderness. And anywhere, now let me get to the spiritual. Every place where Christ is the center, every church, every ministry that lifts Jesus Christ, not personalities, not people, not you and me, not about what I can do, not the big titles sometimes we, we enjoy. They are not bad. But where we actually lift Jesus himself and humble ourselves, we behave like um, John the Baptist who said, uh, uh, he must increase and I must decrease. When that principle operates, Jesus begins to move to save lives. There is a spiritual breakthrough that brings salvation and people begin to come to the Lord. You'll find in the service, people are pulled and because the message and the songs and the testimony and the spirit that prevails in the church is about exalting the Lord and exalting Jesus Christ as the head of the church, as long as that prevails, then people come to the Lord. Because the right message and the right spirit and the right place of man is already well defined and the proper place of the Lord is well kept. He must be lifted up. He said in another, in, another, in another verse that when I, the son of man, am lifted up, I will draw men after myself. He's the one who pulls men to himself. He also said, I will build my church. He's the one who builds his church. It's not about my church. It's not about Tala's church. It's not about Eric's church. It's not about Lubanga's church. It's about his church. And so we must exalt him and he must be the center and he must be all that we talk about. And he deserves it. He is the Lord. Amen. The Bible says, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So we must pick that. Sometimes we read John 3.16, but we don't know that the momentum begins from verse 14. So let's verse, verse, verse 15, it says, 
when we behave like Moses, like Moses did in the wilderness, then whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now, we're giving all here that it is whosoever believeth, it is free. Man has a choice to make. And that should come out in our preaching message, that this is the condition of man. He is headed to eternal punishment, but God has made a provision for his rescue. Nonetheless, he has to make his personal decision so that he says, I believe it, and I believe Jesus is my savior, and he died for me, that though I have not seen him, I believe him. And though I have not um, been able to see him physically, I can rejoice with joy and speak him. Whosoever believeth. We cannot force people to get born again. We cannot force people. Don't use any form of coercion to get people to church. That is not salvation. It will be something else. You're building religion. Don't try to push people to follow you. Don't try to pull people because they are your relatives or friends and you are not telling them, repent, because unless you repent, you shall likewise perish. If we don't tell them, we are not preaching the gospel. The Bible says it is whoever, whosoever that believes that does not perish. Now that's the meaning there. Now look at now verse 16, our favorite verse that we keep quoting. I'm sure all of us have memorized this one. For God so loved the world. So it's out of love that he did this. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth like we have learned in him should not perish. So man is headed to perishing. That message must become very clear. We have emphasized that but have everlasting life. God has a plan to give life to man. This life is the life of God himself. He wants to share his life with man. When the life of God is in you, the Bible says whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Hallelujah. I man, feel like preaching. Man, man. Preach whatsoever man is man. born of God overcometh the world. That means God is willing to share his very life with you. And so when he shares that life, it is the eternal life. It is the everlasting life that we shall live forever with him. A young man was, uh, I went to a barber and, 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 and in that Kinyozi, when a young man was uh, shaving me, he started asking me very interesting questions. And he said, you know, the Bible says that we are going to heaven. I don't even the Bible does not say we are going to heaven. The Bible says we should enter his kingdom. We should strive to enter by the narrow door. The Bible does not tell us we are going to heaven. If, in fact, it doesn't tell us to strive to go to heaven. It says he shall come to pick us. When we enter into this kingdom, we share the life of Jesus Christ. When he appears, we shall be like him. He is the one who will come to pick us. But religion is trying to strive to go to heaven by their own means, by their own distorted gospel. That is not true gospel. True gospel is Jesus is coming back and is coming back to establish his kingdom. And those that are ready, he will be able to pick them so that wherever he is, they also will be there. Somebody should say an amen there. Hallelujah. Amen. Verse 17. Amen. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So the agenda of God is salvation, salvation, salvation. Please let us not be, um, let us not be consumed and overoccupied with the wrongs a person has done. Let us be, be preoccupied with the, with the message of rescue. Because God's intention is not to condemn the world. The world is already condemned. The, the message of God is not to condemn man. The message of God, and that's why it's called the message of salvation, the good news, because it's, it's a message of rescue. The message we are talking about here is about his son with a, in a, that, that came on a mission to be a ransom, a sacrifice for the redemption of man so that man can be saved. That's the message. And whosoever rejects then remains waiting for the consequences of a condemned world. That should be our message. Let's, let not our emphasis be to scare people by fire. 
hell is coming, you'll burn. People will not have true salvation because they don't understand what you're talking about. We should understand, yes, we are being rescued, but we are coming to be citizens of the kingdom and we are coming to share in the life of God and we are coming to be sons of God. And they should come because they are hungry and they are thirsty for it. And when they get it, they are strong and they overcome the enemy. Hallelujah. God did not come to condemn the world. He shall come. He'll come back. The first mission was not a mission of condemnation. That was a mission of salvation. There will be a second mission when he will come now to judge the world. That's where condemnation will come. Hallelujah. In verse 18, we are talking about the message of salvation. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Dearly beloved brethren, this is our message. That you don't have to live in guilt. You don't have to live in bondage. You don't have to live uh, feeling like, like, like God does not want you, feeling of being separated from God, feeling like God is so far. No, he's very near because he has already made a way of salvation, a way of deliverance. And I think really Amen. this is important for Amen. us. When Amen. we emphasize the right message, we will receive the right results. We will have sons into the kingdom. We'll have citizens of the kingdom. We'll have sons and daughters born into the kingdom. Our message is about reconciliation. We were driven away by our own sin because we are sinful by nature. But God has come to reconcile the world back to himself. It's a message of building a family, building a, a kingdom, building a household of faith. I want to... Uh, stop it there. Then next time, God willing, uh, you'll be able to give us grace. We shall look at the second uh, message, the, the second part uh, of salvation, uh, our salvation message. I think let me just stop it there and say, may the Lord bless each one of us. May the Lord minister to us and bless us and help us. Please revisit the scriptures we have shared. There's much more scriptures. So I just picked a few. Uh, reveal those verses. Uh, God helping you connect with other verses and condense your message. If you can condense your message to, to be able to be shared in five minutes, then you are a, a very effective witness of Jesus Christ. Let us have the right message. Let us not shy away from sharing the message because God has made a way of rescue to get me man free from the dominion of darkness, to get man free from the fear of death, to get man freed from the consequences of sin. The Lord bless you. The Lord do you good. In Jesus' name, amen. And all the people say, amen. 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 amen.